So, cool. We're rolling. I'm going to sync up the audio. Cool. Lorenzo Hernandez. Take one. Was that really like it? That's the intro. Like the right clap. There. Like that's the intro. <laughs> clap on. All right. Clap, clap on. on. Clap on. No. Cool. Ready? Sink it. Let's do it. Send Ready? It. Yeah. Let's do it. Booyah. <laughs> What's our intro? <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> Okay, got it. Yeah, there it is. And today, we dance. <laughs> hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Nathan Crane. I'm Derek Crane. We're the co-founders of Crane Factor and hosts for the Activating Greatness podcast. Activating Greatness is about living with greatness every single day understanding yourself and being true to who you are and creating greatness in every area of your life. And today we are honored and excited to have our dear friend here, Lorenzo Hernandez from Undisputed Fitness with us on this podcast. Thank you, sir. Welcome, brother. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> so quick little background on Lorenzo. He started doing CrossFit back in 2008. He's a proud owner and current head coach of Undisputed Fitness here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He holds a CFL2, CF Strongman, CF Powerlifting from Conjugate, USAW Weightlifting and Crossroads Adaptive Coach Certifications, and is a proud father and husband, Lorenzo. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Excited. Hey, brother. So you own Undisputed Fitness. You're, Correct. You're, you're a gym owner. It's a, I think of it as a very successful gym here in Santa Fe. It's doing really well. I think your systems are dialed in, the people, the coaches, like the environment, the energy is amazing, but getting there for you has probably been a pretty intense and tough and challenging road. Still is. Yeah. <laughs> it still is. So, yeah. so you, were, you went to prison. I did. Yeah. yeah. And uh, talk about that for a bit. Um, let's see. It's, uh, it's been, wow, what are we, September now? Uh, five years ago, I was released. So, uh, in August, so it, uh, it's been a total of eight years. The whole thing happened. Um, I had done a lot of dumb stuff when I grew up and growing up in this town, as uh, you guys know, growing up in small towns is you can find yourself some trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, especially I was, uh, <clears throat> I was involved in a lot of the crowds. I was a social butterfly. So I knew a lot of the ins and outs of town, um, so wherever I moved to, I would naturally take my maybe entrepreneurial ways in, in the wrong way to that city and start these things. And then I'd go to another city and start these things. And, and eventually uh, those things caught up with me. Um, I was, was living in Austin, Texas, and uh, that's when the, the peak of our marijuana sales was. And uh, then uh, I found out that somebody got in trouble and I found out that there was a lot of talking going involved in it. Um, and so me being naive and clouded by probably a ton of uh, drugs and alcohol, I left Austin and moved to San Diego. And I think San Diego is where I really started to shift my mindset on maybe this isn't the right way. Mm. Um, so I started surfing every day. Um, waking up early and when was this uh, 2000 2008 okay. actually because um, that's where I started CrossFit um, so started waking up early started doing surfing enjoying it learning teaching by myself basically because it, it, it's you know, you've lived in Southern California yeah. it's a very hard place to find friends like, right. nobody wants to talk to you it's weird <laughs> but anyway there's, uh, there's a million people yeah. and yet you feel you can feel isolated yeah they don't want to talk to you uh, so I just went out there and, and enjoyed the time um, started working at Whole Foods started doing regular stuff you know um and uh, it's funny, when I was out there, I was out there for about two years, and then everything, you know, as just kind of just going through life, when I would drive home from San Diego to Carlsbad, it's about an hour. I lived in both those cities. Yeah, did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So, uh, yeah, I would drive home, and, and on my way driving home, uh, I would uh, kind of daydream, and as I would daydream, there would just be like this blank slate that I could never get past mm. as I was mm. thinking. Like a barrier in your mind yeah. of yeah, like what, seeing the future or what? I guess, yeah, yeah you know. Um, were you still selling then at this point? I think we were like selling a little bit. Uh, my ex-wife, uh, she was in the marijuana like legal business there. Mm-hmm. So we were involved in it, but no- nothing like involved, you know what I mean? Um, so we would sell a little bit, but nothing drastic. And uh, I, would, I would still get high uh, and drink. Um, but like when I would drive home, there would just be this something I couldn't see past whatever it was, mm. right? Um, finally started meeting some friends, started enjoying California a little bit more. Um, the day that everything started making sense was June 28th, 2010. Mm-hmm. And I had uh, just woke up i heard slamming on my door i was supposed to meet my buddy at 6 a.m to go surfing so i was like oh shit i uh overslept Mm -hmm. so i like get out of the get out of bed run to the door and they're swatting and i'm like what you're like you're not here to go surfing (laughs) yeah yeah so i uh (laughs) they're like open the door open the door and i'm like i think you have the wrong house (laughs) i was like literally like i think you have the wrong house right and uh uh, my ex-wife was like coming to the door and they like started slamming the door in and they came in guns drawn like viciously just like uh, came in and i was like who are you looking for who are you looking there and they were like uh, lorenzo hernandez and, and hannah ray and i was like oh that's us awesome. right so they tore up the house you know and uh i, I that it didn't really make sense i kind of had an idea um but then uh, when they took us in they started asking these questions and i was like ah get it i get what's going on right now so uh it was weird Uh, i didn't really know what was happening for a little while it took about a week for all the information to get relayed to me Mm -hmm. for some reason san diego's uh the federal prison system down there was just it was wacky so i didn't get like phone calls and like everything was weird so like my family didn't know where i was for a week uh, I didn't really know like the severity of the charges, and there were several charges on it because it was a conspiracy that just added on and on. Like felony charges? Uh, yeah. So there was just like a myriad of them, starting from this one dude that started telling on me a long time ago to like it just started building. So they were building a case over time. Yeah, there was little ones and there was a big one. So do you think you were out of the clear with that when you were like I th- up from 08 to 2010? Yeah, you I thought. Like, you thought you outran yeah, your past. Yeah, I thought like, you know, like it was going to stay. Because when we were in Texas, I saw people start taking pictures of our house and I was like, oh, mm. we're out. Um, so literally like when all this was going down, we, we were here in Santa Fe and I flew back to, uh, to Austin and, I don't know, I'm sorry, we flew to San Diego and we put like six months rent down on the house. Flew to Austin, packed up in three days, and left. Mm. Like, it was legitimately, like, yeah, see ya. Come out of here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I thought it was going to stay state. I, I just was naive. Mm. You, know, was, you know what I mean? You're just, you, yeah. your ego gets the best of you. And uh, that's what happened. Um, so, once all that went down, uh, you know, they started telling me all the charges. And, you know, all the charges adding up. Like, it was it was you know, 15 years to life, basically. Jeez. You know what I mean? Just all of them. So, it had to be scary. I, I asked if I asked my my public defender. I was like, "Did somebody die in the case? Like, like what happened?" Yeah. And she was like, "No, this is this is what conspiracy is all about." And I'm like, "It's amazing." And it was all cannabis, or it was other drugs too? It was, it, yeah. There was, it was. Well, I was involved in smaller ones, and then the biggest one that they had us all pinned in, and like they thought we were like this cartel thing that like i was like i don't even know who these people are but they just pin you because like one person says one thing one person gets busted and then like all of a sudden the names like cross each other and like yeah. oh they're all together right. you know it's whatever they think but i mean they had a saying like like you know a ham sandwich can what do they say something like a uh, ham and cheese sandwich can create a conspiracy the ham tells on the cheese and you're over <laughs> like, it's it's weird you know what i mean, I mean yeah you can almost get a conspiracy on yourself Mm. by yourself mm. <laughs> stupid mm. the, the way that they have that law but so when everything started coming down and I'm like and it was weird it was just July it was June 28th you know and then 4th of July weekend was that next weekend I think and I'm sitting there in high rise of 
federal prison in, in San Diego and I'm just looking out at the ocean and there's like fireworks. Freedom. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> I don't. I like, and I didn't know. I'm like, I could be gone for a long time. I yeah. have no idea. Yeah. Um, and then we almost got bailed out in in San Diego, but they, they were they were like telling they were trying to get the judge to think that we were like hiding. And I'm like, how am I hiding? I'm like, working under my name, my social security number, right. like my phone number is the same. Like yeah, nothing's yeah. changed. Yeah. But and then we ended up getting bail, and they ended up taking us uh, and. Um, Getting uh, or taking us from San Diego all the way to Texas because Texas is where our case was out of. Ah, okay. Um, so they uh, ended up taking us from like the day before we were supposed to get bailed out. They're like, nope, you guys are going here. So you went to Texas and yeah. then you went to prison for how long there? Three years. Three years. Yeah. So what was your, what do you think, two questions, what mm-hmm. was your greatest challenge from that whole experience? And then what was the greatest thing you learned from it? The greatest challenge from that. Um, I think the greatest challenge was probably, and, and maybe that was going into it, was realizing how um, how many people's lives I ruined. Mm. Um and not to just feeling guilty about that and yeah and not even to like the fact that like I sold drugs to people I mean it, it may sound fucked up but it like wasn't the case it was like it was like oh god I want to fucking cry um yeah my mom she apologized to me and she was like I'm sorry that I wasn't a better mom to you and mm. that like just crushed mm. me it just crushed me because it, it wasn't her fault you know right, what I mean right but she took the blame, um, and that was probably the biggest challenge going in. Um, I had a bail, I had a break for like almost, I think it was almost a month. Um, and I, I think ch- like it's weird driving yourself to a five year prison sentence. Mm. That's what much I got, you know what I mean? But it's like weird to like drive myself <laughs> to prison. You're like, I'm. The Mexico was probably looking pretty good. At that yeah. <laughs> well, my mom asked when it first went down and like everything was like, and she got to talk to me face to face. She's like, are you going to, are you going to stay and, and do it? And I'm like, I'm not going to run. Like, yeah. It'd be a whole thing. <laughs> be stupid. You know? It'd be a, a much worse life. For yeah. Sure. Um, so that was a big challenge. Uh, just taking that in and, and. And then it like it went from there. Feeling like you let your mom down and yeah, and family then it down. Went and from there, my brothers, like about. everybody, you know, and 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 it was it was as you would find out later. It was just a selfish thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and your greatest greatest learning experience from all of it. The greatest learning experience from all of it is that uh, it's it's amazing how many, I guess the the mindset that I learned in there is like. It's incredible how quick our minds can be like, oh, this is a great idea. And it's such a selfish decision. Mm. Um, so I think the biggest thing that I learned from that is that when I make decisions now, I ask myself, is this a selfish decision or is this like a decision that can help everybody? Mm. Um, because every, every they call it like criminal thinking. Um, they right. call it, uh, and there's several terms that they call it. Because like, I went through a nine-month intensive, um, it's called RDAP, and it's a drug rehabilitation program. Yeah. Right? And it's not just, it, it church drugs is like the outlet of it, but it's like deeper than that, right? Mm-hmm. And this is stuff that I've done before, but it was just different, right? Because you're actually like the universe was talking so long that like finally I was like, oh, I'm going to listen. You know, mm-hmm. like you know, mm-hmm. it took this for me to be like oh wow I'm gonna actually listen to this um, but they call it criminal thinking it's like you know you're gonna be like well this serves me and I'm gonna buy you a car and you're gonna be happy like you know it's cause I bought my mom a car and I'm like you can be happy and you're not gonna tell me that I'm doing anything bad right, right. you're getting some benefit out of this uh, right. or you know there's different there's different ways of kind of like allowing people to be like oh it's all okay but it's just a selfish reason for you to be like, no, this is what I'm doing. Right. And that can be in anything. It can be in criminal thinking. It can be in in anything that's just self like, where it's just solely about, like, your take. You know what I mean? And, 
and not caring about anybody else right. or how it affects them, right? Even not thinking about that, right? Really. Not even yeah. thinking about what it's going to do to them. Like, no, this yeah. is going to help me. And it's really probably going to affect you more. So, right. That's probably one of the biggest things that I took away from being. And how's your relationship with your mom now? It's good. I mean, you know, I mean, there's... you guys seem really tight. I mean, she comes to the gym, she works out, she <laughs> yeah. does the classes. I mean, that's the cool super... thing, man. Like we, like you know, there's she has all boys, and we've all had that relationship with my mom. Like we've all been super close to my mom. Yeah, all of, like you know, my mom and and Ian and Dom's dad separated. My my brother stayed with my with my mom. Um, she just has. I mean, she's she's strong. She just has that bond with her boys. You know. Yeah. Um. So it was, we never, it wasn't like a separation between us. It was just a, like, like for years, years, it was all just about me. Like, it's all I cared about was like, I'm going to take this and I'm going to do this and, and, and like, I'm just going to plow through everybody. Now, would you say that you're thinking about everybody else in, in most of the decisions you make now? I think I still struggle. Yeah. 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 I, there's, there's. There's times that I, I still struggle with that, you know. Um, I I do the best I can to keep ahead of it, but, you know, there's times where I catch myself struggling with that still. Well, and I think there's decision. a balance too, right? Because, like, I've been on both ends of that spectrum too, you know. Same thing, dealing drugs, in jail, running from the DEA, that, that whole thing. You know, I was 15, 16 years old. Like, yes. So I relate to your story yeah. like, it's yeah, like, oh, know. he's telling me my story. Yeah. <laughs> you know how it is. So I know what that's like. You're yeah. just selfish. But then the other end of the extreme, too, is that you can be too giving and not take care of yourself oh, yeah. at all. No. And that's where I think it's so important to balance, right? That, yeah, we're always thinking about, you know, how can I help other people and how is this going to affect people? But at the same time, if we forget about our own life, then our health goes to the trash. We don't sleep good enough. I think it's health, the relationships. Like, I mean, I think that's the thing is like me and Jen have that, you know, dilemma a lot. It's Jen's like, your wife. For yeah. Anyone Jen. who doesn't know you. Yeah. Um, and she and I kind of both have that thing where we like, we won't say no to things. Mm. And then all of a sudden it's like we're jam packed every single day. And then right. there's like zero time for us. There's zero time for our family. And then we're like... And then it comes out in different ways. You know what I mean? We're like frustrated and feeling like we're alone or feeling like these things aren't happening. So we have to like consciously make two week uh, scheduling. Like this is going to happen for the next two weeks and like ahead. So we're not like, well, we're already doing this. We can't say yes to this. You know what I mean? We have to be like, no, we can't do that that weekend. Because every weekend. How, how, do you, how do you do that? So you have your two-week block. Mm -hmm. You guys are scheduled out. Yeah. Do you find that you're that that's pretty easy for you to do now and go, something new comes in and you're just like, you just say no to it because you know you can't fit it in? Or how do you deal with that? Yeah. Um, more It's more a month block now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because like, there's things that are happening and I just have to make sure that that we both don't forget, you know what I mean? Because yeah. there is so much happening still at the same time. Right. That if I'm not like at the first of the month, and I know Jen's got this outing that she has to do with all her birth fit chicks, is that at, on the third weekend of the month, and I'm like, oh no, we're going to do this Olympic lifting meet at the gym. And she's like, well, F you. Yeah, right. Thanks for thinking about me. So like we have it, I think just like right there on a thing, and I like every day I look at it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I look at it, and like in my calendar, I just have every three days to make sure I'm like ahead of it all the time, you know, cause it's, uh, just thinking ahead and planning it and sticking to it. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's times where, where I want like times for us. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so you started CrossFit in 08, yep. went to prison yep. and you ended up, how did you end up coaching people <laughs> in prison what with CrossFit. There? Yeah. <laughs> Cause like, where, didn't you guys kind of come up with your own thing and we're like teaching people CrossFit in prison? So the full circle of undisputed, right? Is, um, I was out on bail and I ran into Tate and, uh, one of the older, um, coaches that were there for a while and they heard about my story and they were like, good, come and train at the gym for free and hang out. So I was like, sweet. So I went and trained, and uh, that's when I really started getting more involved in it. Because before I would do it, my ex-wife did it, and I would do it, and I had fun. Um, but then uh, 
I just kind of got out of it and was surfing more. Yeah. But then when I was here, I did a little bit more. And actually, Heather and Tate would send me what they were doing at the gym because we call it jail space, but it's like a, a, a email um, interaction that you can have with people that are on your email list. Mm. So you can email whoever, and they would email me this stuff. Um, so I would just get information from them. My mom would send me a bunch of stuff, and I would just keep reading and studying. And When I walked in, when I first walked in into prison, I told myself that I would not waste a day. Mm. And that was like one of my mantras. Like, today I will not waste one moment. Where did that come from, do you think? Um, I think it was just so many years that I just didn't take advantage of the time. Do you know what I mean? And, and this was, just hit you. You just had that realization. This was the time, man. It was like it was like when I moved to San Diego, I was going through that, and this was just like the biggest slap in the in from the universe. And I was like, all right, like it has to change. Like yeah. there's no this or that. Like this has to change. So I uh, just made a mantra to myself that I just wouldn't waste it. So I studied everything I could: nutrition, exercise. Got my GED in prison. Like I just every day you know what wow. I mean because a lot of times when you go to prison people will just like either sleep their time away or watch their TV or get day. worse mm-hmm. or get, get involved worse. in yeah, right, yeah. or yeah. just do dumb shit right so I just stuck my nose in a book and and it's the most reading I've ever done and I'm like kind wow. of like mad that I don't read that much right now because yeah. it, it was a fun time you know but I just learned and then I started teaching well Will was with me at that point Will's a coach at the gym and good friend of mine because we were in the same case. You know? Right. So he was in, in my cell at that point. And then I was teaching him a little bit. And then uh, eventually, like, our other cellmate was like, what are you guys doing? We're doing this. And I would teach him. And then, like, and then it just started growing. And then, like, after a while, I was, like, having, like, three classes a day. It was, like, one in the morning, one at nine, and one at two. It was just, like, a thing. You know? People watching you do this kind of crazy way. Of People were like, out. what are you doing? That was the biggest thing. Like, you guys don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> Butterfly pull-ups are like, dude. It was funny. Um, so it, it all started there. And uh, this place that we started it was Inglewood in uh, Colorado. Uh, and then I was there for about a year. And then I moved to Canyon City, which is southern Colorado. Um and I was there for just about a year again. And down there, I moved down there, and um, I knew a couple people from the old spot that I was at. And some other dude there, uh, were you around when Doug was around? Any of you guys? Doug, bald, tattooed. I don't remember. I don't know. He was a coach, athlete. Anyway. Uh, no, I don't think so. So I met him in prison, right? And he came, I came in, and my buddy was like, dude, this dude Doug is doing CrossFit, right? And blah, blah, blah. And, I, you know that point I've been doing it for a little bit and uh, and then he came up to me he's like bro I don't I have no idea what I'm doing actually so like help me out <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> and so we started doing it and at that point like then I had like I, I think there was like 25 people doing it you know what I mean and wow yeah and uh, it, it was religious and I mean things I would take back but to doing that that I know now but <laughs> that's besides the story um so we were just doing a bunch of CrossFit all the time. And then uh, then I got moved again. They like to move people. So I got moved again. Then I moved to uh, uh, South Dakota. That was where I spent the last time, last Jeez. moments of prison. Um, and it was there uh, I actually met a guy that went into prison for um, some kind of tax evasion. And he owned two CrossFit gyms in um, Florida. Hmm. First time I ever met anybody that knew what I was doing or that I even, like, like, there was an outside of anything of, besides get jacked. Right. In prison, you know right. what I mean? Um, so I met him. He told me about all these seminars he went to. And, like, then it, like, I started, like, clicking. And I was like, oh, damn, like, you could do this, like, mm. a thing. You know what I mean? Uh, um, <clears throat> and, you know, he said, like, you know, his he was a business dude. So he was like, I see probably about 15 to 20 years of, like, growing in CrossFit. You know? I guess that was about five years ago now. And it's still growing, right, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, so he was the first person that, like, when we were working out together, like, he stopped and he's like, dude, he's like, you are really good at this. And I was like, oh. Mm. So it, it kind of, like, already started, like, clicking. Like, okay, well, maybe I can do this. Maybe this is, I mean, I love doing it. And I love actually doing it. I love teaching it. So it was, 
it was a thing. So um, you found something that you were passionate about. Yep. You did it a lot. You got really good at it. And now you turn it into a business helping other people. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So along the way, I mean, obviously you've learned a lot about, I mean, even before when you were, when you were selling and, and all that, you were obviously learning about leadership and business and all that stuff, right? But yeah. through this journey, <laughs> you know, in one way. Yeah. You're, I mean, it, it, it changes. The, yeah. You're changing the, the moving parts. But yeah. I mean, same you know, principles, no. different intentions. Yeah. Right? Way different. <laughs> so <laughs> but you've obviously learned a lot about leadership. Uh, you're running a business. You're a father. You're a husband. You're an incredible coach. Excellent. What are some of the. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and I see that uh, in a big way. I mean, I hear a lot of people that come from out of town come to Undisputed oh. and they say you guys you know there's something different here like you guys really know what you're doing the coaches know what they're doing I go to gyms uh, we have a cousin who went to a CrossFit gym in Idaho and they're like these people don't know anything about what they're doing people go to other gyms and it's like uh, they don't they just don't have the experience a lot of cases right. not all but right a lot of cases they just don't have the experience yeah. or the you know the background maybe the commitment maybe the skill set Whereas Undisputed, like, I feel really blessed because it's the only CrossFit gym I've worked out at right. so far. Right. And, like, all the coaches really know what they're doing. Yeah. And so, and a lot of that is because of the leadership and the vision that you've brought into it. And so, you know, for takeaway for people listening and watching, what are some of your greatest lessons uh, that you've learned in leadership and maybe are continuing to, to learn and apply today? Uh, make sure you always have somebody that tells you that you suck. Yeah. <laughs> or point out things that you're yeah. doing uh, wrong. Or, yeah. yeah. I, th I think that's the biggest thing, man. And and for me, being the head coach or, or whatever, you know what I mean, or being the forefront of the leadership thing is like, I have to search for people to be like, yeah, that's not the way you should do it. Mm. And my wife's really good at that, actually. <laughs> 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 that's not the way you do it. Be, be a leader. Oh. Um, but, uh, but I, like I, I had to search out for mentors, um, and, uh, and, and that's scary because nobody likes to be told that they're not good. You know what I mean? Or, or, or that you're in a vulnerable situation where you're like, all right, well, I think I know what I'm doing. And then I realize that I don't, but I think it's that mindset right. that you keep is that like, I, I don't know. I won't ever know. Um, but that's what keeps me passionate about learning is mm. that like, it doesn't matter because there's somebody that will always know more than me. Right. Um, but I can always learn more at the same time. You know what I mean? I think that's like the evolution of leadership is as long as you're vulnerable enough to take criticism and vulnerable enough to be like, yeah, like I don't know about these things and it just allows more space to grow in. Yeah. Um, and I try to get everybody to be on that same page. You know what I mean? And it's hard. Like there's conversations that nobody likes to have, you know, like well, on my way here, I had to have a conversation that nobody likes to have. Right. But like you have to have them. And if that person wants to grow, and I think that's part of like the leadership thing is like when I'm going into those things, I'm like, okay, I can just go over there and I could like, shit on you and then like what happens right like nothing like you don't actually get anywhere like i don't get anywhere maybe i feel a little better for a second but then i don't get anywhere right, right. and then i feel bad but then nothing ever evolves right the people don't evolve they're like oh maybe i should think about it that way so for me because if you don't know i actually i have a pretty hot temper mm -hmm. <laughs> you may not know that but um so I have to like watch what I say yeah. because my emotions will get the best of me. Right. And so I have to think and be like, which way is the best way to talk to you about this? Because I could be like, Bleh. right. Mm -hmm. I could be like, you should see it this way, or maybe this will be a way you can see it better. How do you prepare yourself for those tough conversations? Do you uh, have uh, any practices you do, anything in particular? Yeah, I kind of go through a scan through my body. Um, I talk about this in coaches prep. Like if I'm having a shitty day outside of work, like I walk right when I'm walking through the door or walking to the door, I'm like scanning through my body and like seeing what areas are hot mm -hmm. um, and trying to really just calm myself down and remember why I'm here. Um, so the same thing, really. Yeah. It's like, why am I doing this? Why do I need to address this? Um, twofold on that sometimes it can like mess with my head too like is this something that like is it emotional 
driven thing or is it like something that's actually should be addressed you know what yeah, i mean yeah and i for me i have to really learn to fire the trigger on that because sometimes i'll let it be like maybe it's just me and then i'll see it again and then i'll be like maybe it's just me and then right. it'll fester and then it'll be like well you do it this way and I'm like, oh. yeah that's the wrong way so like i said like so rather than waiting too long and letting it build out. I'm still struggling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's challenging for yeah. sure. I mean, and especially when you're a father too. You're like, oh, that was bad. Way. <laughs> it's a really bad way to handle it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So. Yeah. So in Coach's Prep, talk yeah. a little bit about that. So I've been going to Coach's Prep for a little while now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's an incredible program Thanks, for, mm-hmm. you know, coaches, leadership, just anybody interested in being a better leader, teacher, you know, coach, consultant. Um, I think it's awesome that you started that, yeah. that Undisputed. And Thanks, I think man. the people that are part of it really get the value out of it. You know, it's making them better, not only athletes, but, you know, see themselves as leaders within the gym too, whether they're going to be coaches there or not. Right. right. Yeah. So what is it that sparked you to do that? And what are some of the, you know, so it was last March, uh, or no, what, wow, this March, where does time go? Mm-hmm. Um, this March, I was uh, going through some downs, I guess, of uh, trying to find inspiration, trying to, I, I say this in coaches prep, I say this in my meetings with my coaches currently, it's like, I have to actively search for things that are going to inspire me, either like mm-hmm. people or programs or my mentor, because Santa Fe can be such a complacent city, mm. because there's, I don't want to say there's not competition because there's always competition. But like if I was in Denver right. and there was four other gyms right down the street from me that have even higher um, skilled coaches than me, then then my drive would be a little bit different. Right. Right? I'd be like, oh man, there's hungry people. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I try to keep that because like I had a guy from CrossFit HQ email me and be like, hey, I'm thinking about moving to town. And I'm like, cool. But then my back of my head, I'm like, damn, he could bring his whole crew here and just demolish all of us. Like, yeah. you know, you know, and maybe that's a fear thing, but like at the same time, it's like, it inspires me to stay ahead and yeah, keep yeah. everybody fired up, you know? So um, it was last March and I was like kind of going down. I'm like, what am I doing? Am I doing this? And it was like still like the, the, the back and forth with buying the gym and like we were going back and forth with negotiations and I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? So... Um, my mentor, uh, Logan Gelbrick owns Deuce Gym. Um, he Is had a business coach or uh, overall mentor, just or? coach mentor. Yeah. Coach mentor. He, um, had a, uh, a leadership summit that he put on and, uh, <clears throat> it was in, it was really cool going to this summit. It was the first time I was in the States. So I went to it and, uh, it had like giant people there. It had Carl Paoli in there. It had, uh, Ryan Schultz, who's the, uh, Ramwa dude. Um, it had Shane Farmer, who's the rowing dude, uh, Nate F- uh, Helming, who's the running dude. Mm-hmm. Like, it had these big, giant people here, right? And so the energy was just very high in that sense and, and with skill level, you know? So I felt honored to be there with them. Yeah. Um, but as the thing was going on, you know, it, 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 it's things that I've worked on. Like, when we were away and when I've been out prior to like being in prison, like these internal things you have to always work on to be better. So it's the same thing. Like, you know, it's the, the whole meeting and the whole, or the whole summit was just all about like, you have to look within if you want to lead without, you know what I mean? Right. And, uh, when he was going through all these things and how they do it at Deuce, you know, and, and we have coaches prep, but we do it like every once in a while. And, you know, the more that he was talking, the more I was like, our, culture that we have right now is what isn't growing in the sense where like people do come in and like yeah Santa Fe's different right but like I think what we were missing is like if I can get people that are within the gym every day having getting to know more right about everything movement themselves their possibilities um, then that's going to transform into anything that they do. Yeah. And maybe I don't get one coach out of it, but what do I get? I get a culture of people that are driven to be better. Mm-hmm. So the movement part, the CrossFit part, whatever is just, it's, it's kind of a vehicle to all these other things, right? But to perform at your best, 
you kind of need to have internal work and learn to lead um, other people to do the same thing. I love that. I mean, we just, our, our podcast last week was about um, different qualities of leadership. Yeah, the five qualities I was listening to. Yeah, and one, of the, one of the qualities that, that we had talked about was empowering people in your organization to be leaders. Yeah. And you're doing that. Yeah. A lot of a lot of CEOs and business owners I've met, I've done a lot of business consulting in the last like 10 years, and a lot, especially small to medium-sized businesses, they're afraid to give that power over to their team because they think uh, they're going to lose power. Yeah. But actually, what you realize is that it give, I, I don't want to say it gives you more power, but it gives you, I think it gives you as a leader, more freedom. Yeah. And, and a better environment, a better culture, better organization overall, because people want to be there, want to get better, and want to help other people too. Yeah. Are you finding that in Coaches Prep? More and more now. Yeah. I mean, it's the, the, the amount of, of uh, support that I see throughout the community is huge. More than I've seen it before. You know what I mean? And, and like I said, when I first started there, going I, when I first started at, at Undisputed, um, there was a lot that was wrong. Um, and I don't want to, like, there wasn't any fault to the people that were doing it. They just weren't led in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And that was the problem. Because there wasn't a leader leading them like this is the right way, right. and to be a leader, you have to like be involved, like you do. You can't just be like calling them and be like, "Yeah, this isn't working," and they're like, "How do you know what's working?" Right. Like, so you have to really be involved. So I saw that, and now you know, for the last like two years um, of you know fully running the gym, it was I was swimming uphill big time. You know, if you talk to some people like that had been there prior to us moving. Um, and now here now they would tell you it's night and day, mm. like completely night and day. Mm. Know, there was tons of people that had left because of situations and how coaching attitudes were, um, and now they come back and they're like it's like a bright day every time I come in here, you nice. know. And that's like for me is like yeah, you know those days that you're like is anything working? Am I doing anything? Am I getting anywhere? Yeah. And you see those, you're like oh my god, <laughs> it's working. <laughs> Those little like, and that's the thing, right? Uh, that's what like Logan when we were going through this, he's like, man, when you're a leader, it's like there's the littlest nudge forward, and you're like, you feel freedom, yeah, for a second. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. then all of a sudden, and that's the hard part about being a leader. Like it is on you. Yeah. Like there's a target on you. There, like you feel bombarded with this stuff. You right. know what I mean? And it can be hard and you know and especially in relationships it can be hard because not only do does everybody at the gym get so much of me Mm -hmm. it's hard for my wife to share that right you know what i mean right it's not an easy thing for like for any of that you know what i mean because like everybody at the gym gets a part of me and then she's like well what's left for me so it's hard because you have to like be even, you know, because this is a, the culture is a relationship business. Yeah. That's what it is. Like, yeah. it's not even movement, like I said, anymore. People come in and they just want to be there because they feel mm-hmm. better there. Like, you don't have to work out. Like, just hang out. You feel better. Right. Mm-hmm. You know? And that's the kind of energy that I want. Like, I want mm-hmm. people to just be like, yeah, I just come in, drink my coffee and watch people work out, have good talk and leave, you know? Or sure, I'll work out every once in a while. But like, mm-hmm. that's not like... Yes, I want everybody to move. I think it's great to move, but I you don't have to do CrossFit. It's like a thing. Right. Like it doesn't. That's not the thing that's making you better. You know, um, the energy, the people, the culture is making you better. You just get to sweat every once in a while. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is like yeah, it can be very addicting. Yeah, and, it is. And and I can say, I mean, being in that environment with people who care, who know what they're doing, who want to do a great job, who are dedicated to becoming better, like. That's one of the things that attracts me there and love being a part of it because it's like, it is a community. Yeah. And, and I think CrossFit has a lot of, as, an, or, as a giant, global, growing, conglomerate fitness it's like an industry. Organism. Yeah, it's organism, organism, whatever you want to call it, really it right? It's like, and it's only getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. I think with these new changes that are going to be more modeling like the Olympics format, yeah. Like yeah. I think it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. But, um, you know, I think there are obviously a lot of things CrossFit as an organization needs to fix, like 
anyone can go get certified in a weekend and open a gym. Like that's that's a good model for growing fast. It's yeah. a bad model for consistent, um, uh, uh, you know, a nice. consistent blueprint for gyms to follow where there is consistency among training, education, knowledge, experience. Right. So it's, it's a huge thing. I mean, I, we've had a ton of people come to the gym. I used to be, I'm a CFO one. I used to coach. Cool. You still got to do this. Right. Like Robin, who's in it right now. Yeah. Like she came in and she was like, yeah, I coached and blah, blah, blah. I have CFO one. I have these other ones. And she's like, I want to coach. And I'm like, cool. Well, we do coaches prep her. And that's like how everybody does it. Doesn't matter. You know? And even like there's times where we'd have like people that wanted to leave. Like, well, Will's leaving this, that. And somebody's like, why don't you just go and like hire somebody? I'm like, that's just not the way it goes. Like I need people to go through everything that I'm putting them through right? because then I feel a hundred percent safe that like when I leave that they're doing the same thing I need them to do. Mm. Cause if I don't know how their coaching style is and I don't know that I've took them along the steps of being like, this is what it's like to be a leader here. Then it would be uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Well, and, and I think a takeaway too for any other business owners out there or any other leaders in an organization is, you know, you can do something similar, have a coach's prep, yeah. You know, a leader's prep, but, uh, you know, teach your people how to understand things better, but how to be better leaders along the way, because it's going to help everybody grow and create that deeper it's community. such a psychological thing. Like, I mean, yeah. it is. Leadership is that, no matter if it's teaching movement or running books or running a freaking candy store. Like, you right. know what I mean? There, there has to be some psychological thing that's going to change everybody's mindset to being like, yeah, I'm a part of this team. Mm. Not like, ugh, I gotta go make count chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> right. Being passionate about it. So, yeah. so as we finish, one final question. Yes. Um, what is one, one way that, I'm sure you can name a bunch of ways, but what is one way that you feel you or anybody listening can do to really experience, embody, and activate you know, a level of greatness in their lives, in their business, in their career? Um, I think the first thing you have to do is have gratitude for what you have. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was away, I I still have the book and, and it's like those things that you, these habits that you do and then you want to do them again. And you create this like, I don't have time for, which is an excuse we all come up with sometimes. But I had this uh, several books that every single day I would write something that I was grateful for, because it keeps you there. Yeah. Um, and when when you're there, you're allowed to just see things differently. You know what I mean? Um, instead of just being bombarded by like the bill, the water, the car needs to be this. You know what I mean? And be like, oh pretty cool I like this little scar on my arm whatever it is right you know right. it could be as super as simple as that but I think that I think a lot of people just to achieve greatness you first have to have gratitude for the littlest things that you have right um, and uh, I think once you can have that like everything seems to be a little bit different you know mm. what I mean? it's like all right like if I don't have this cool I'm yeah. grateful that I have all this you know what I mean yeah, yeah. and it's hard because I had to have everything taken away from me right. to be like, okay, I can I can manage with this yeah. now. I don't need this. You know what I mean? Where a lot of people, when they don't have that or haven't had that, it's hard to like, like we don't need all this. We just need this. Right. We, we need so such small things in our life and we just be like, I need this and I get this and now I have more and then you're sitting in full of garage of shit and you're like, this is dumb. It reminds me of uh, Lynn Twist, who was one of our keynote speakers at the Ageless Living Conference that I produced. And yeah. one of the things she said was, like, a lot of people can't consciously or subconsciously identify with abundance, even though they want abundance, because you're still even subconsciously in lack mentality. Right. And so one of the things that she learned that made so much sense to me is, is exactly what you're saying, which is about... Just recognizing the the energy of sufficiency, yeah. Like feeling sufficient as you are, which yeah. one of those practices, as you said, is like being grateful for what you have. Feeling sufficient, like sufficiency means like oh, everything is sufficient. I have food in the fridge. I'm gonna you know things are taken care of. Like, and that eventually can turn into abundance. Sure. 
But you can't get to abundance from lack without already feeling like you have everything you need. Yeah. So well, we really don't need that much stuff. Like that's the thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, really. Yeah. None of us need these things that we sometimes do and get, and we're like, oh, do I really need this? And we all. I mean, it's not like I. I not saying that because it's like go to my house and I'm a minimalist but yeah, yeah. like th- there's times where I'm like I don't know why I need this and every time I get rid of it I'm like oh god this is so <laughs> right. good that it's gone yeah. you know what I mean and that's it's like a purging thing but you know to figure out if the the more narrow thing or not narrow but the less things that we need to make us happy then I think that gives us more space to like I think love um, will always make us get more Mm -hmm. do you know what I mean Um, and I can't remember what this quote was but like it was something with like love makes you feel part of everything Mm. right like Mm -hmm. part of everything like that I think that's why people know when I'm coaching like this is what I love to do and that's why everybody feels a part of it right Mm -hmm. Um, or when I'm doing coaches prep things like that right Um, and I think that sometime when we're we think we're wiser than we are, then that becomes a negative aspect to it. And then we're like, Oh, we really don't know anything, you know, when, right. because then we start acting like we know more than we do. Cause yeah. we're like, I'm wise. I know this. And then everybody's like, you don't know nothing. Right. <laughs> Cause it, it shines through, but like yeah, yeah. when it's through love, they're like, everybody's like, they you know they have like the emoji heart eyes. Like, <laughs> 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 it's weird. Right. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. like anybody, like when right. I see you train and I see like the love you have for training, I'm like, Hell yeah, yeah, because I know how much you love it, right? Mm-hmm. But like some people that just like, he doesn't know what he's doing. They have the different right. eyes from it. They're like, but they don't know. Right. Because they don't, they're too afraid to know. I think that's probably what it is. So I love that. So closing thoughts here, gratitude. Be grateful for the things that you have. You also talked about love. Love what you do. Follow your passions. You also talked a lot about humility, recognizing that we don't know everything. <laughs> still have so much to learn. And, and I think those are all incredible qualities of leadership. Thanks, so, you know, we appreciate everyone here tuning in. Mm. Uh, you can download this podcast. Uh, on. You can watch it on YouTube, on iTunes, on Google Play. On, it's all over the internet. If you like this, give it a thumbs up. Leave us your comments, questions below. Please share it. We want to get this information out to as many people as possible. And come to Santa Fe. Go to Undisputed Fitness. Yeah. Check out the the culture, the the incredible energy, the passion uh, that happens there at the gym. Jiu-Jitsu is there. Jiu-jitsu. CrossFit, CrossFit, U-Fit, yeah. BirthFit. BirthFit. Something for everybody. Yeah. Something for everybody. So, Lorenzo, yeah. thanks, thanks, brother. Appreciate, Appreciate you. Thanks for having me, guys. With us, man. Yeah. Awesome. Sweet. Thank you for tuning in today. And remember to live with greatness in every area of your life. Awesome. Clap it's a wrap. Off. Clap off. Clap <laughs> off. Clap off. Clap off. No record. Stop recording. Stop.